global business news from the boardroom or grassroots, Aaron Hesselhurst cuts through the jargon to add colour, depth and context. With live reaction from Wall Street and Asia, studio interviews with top CEOs and the latest innovations in technology. Talking business on BBC World News. Right now, yeah, that's the bell ringing, and we are live around the globe, yeah. Great start. Hello, everybody. Happy Monday. It's time. It's time for the money news that matters. I'm Aaron Hazelhurst, and this is Talking Business. Hey, let's take a look at the top story, the Detroit Auto Show. It's getting into gear, but is the industry going into reverse? Yep, it all comes with sales shrinking, car makers slashing jobs, and trade tensions overshadowing the industry. In fact, virtually none of the German auto giants are going this year. But guess what? We are, yeah, we're gonna go live to Detroit to speak to our very own, there she is, Michelle Fleury, to find out how the makers are navigating all these speed bumps. Also on the program, Donald Trump threatens to devastate Turkey's economy if it attacks America's Kurdish allies in Syria. We're gonna look into what action the US could take and how effective it might be. As always, we'll bring you all the action on the global market. It's not a great start to the week. And time to debunk some workplace myths, yeah. Are millennials really changing the workplace? is the best way to motivate people to pay them more. I say yes. Uh, we're going to sort fact from fiction with the help of a leading psychologist and author. And all of that coming up on this edition of Talking Business. Good morning, America. Evening, Asia. Hello, world. Welcome to the start of the week. And we're going to start in the US, where the engines are revving for the start of the annual Detroit Motor Show. But I tell you what, there are some spanners in the work, certainly threatening to put the brakes on. It's certainly the entire industry. Let's take a look. Because many companies have been, of course, relying on China for growth. It's the world's biggest car market. But sales went into reverse last year, the first time, in fact, since the 1990s, falling that 2.8%. 8%. Sentiment isn't being helped, of course, by those trade tensions with the United States. Now, slowing global sales have prompted a string of the world's biggest car makers, General Motors, Jaguar, Land Rover and Ford, to cut costs, cut production and certainly slash some jobs all at a time when they're switching to electric vehicles. Now, after a 10-year boom, the experts expect North American vehicle sales to shrink in 2019, as consumers certainly feel the squeeze of those rising interest rates. And what about those big importers? Where are they? Nearly all of the big German automakers aren't even attending Detroit this year, which is, well, a bit of a surprise, really, given that nearly 47%, nearly half, of all cars sold here last year in America were imported. There you go. There's a number for you. Bam, let's get rid of the cube. As promised, Michelle, the lucky duck, she is at the Detroit Motor Show and joins us. Michelle, lovely to see you. Hey, listen, normally when you've been there and we've talked to you before in the years, there's a bit of fanfare and all of that, but there's a mighty big cloud hanging over this industry at the moment, which resulted in this year, what? Fewer automakers there where you are and fewer unveilings. Well, that's right. Just 30 models are being unveiled uh, this year. We've seen a couple of them already from Cadillac and also just now uh, from Ford. Part of the reason you're seeing fewer is that this is the last time this auto show, America's premier auto show, is being held here in January. It's moving to the summer to become more consumer focused, really a reflection of where the industry is going. The fact that nowadays people are more excited about autonomous cars, electric vehicles, and so they tend to focus, if you look at the car makers, where they do their big announcement at shows like the Consumer Electronics Show last week. And that's why it's a little bit more subdued than usual. Hearing there, because I was just, I, I saw that number today about how many cars in America sold actually imported, uh, and nearly a half, it's quite a staggering number. Um, so the, the, the impact of the whole tariff uh, and the trade row, what are you hearing there? How much of an impact is it having? Well, I was talking to an analyst yesterday, Aaron, who said that he thought it added probably about 1% to the cost of the car. That is the steel tariffs, uh, which certainly we've heard from car companies complaining about in the past, that consumers, on average, if you take a $3,700, $37,000 car, you're probably seeing $300 more uh, dollars per car for the consumer. 
as for the car makers, it's added uncertainty. Have a listen. This is what GM CEO Mary Barra told me last night. Well, of course, trade is very important, but we remain uh, optimistic that both uh, all of the countries involved in the trade discussions will see that there's opportunity for all economies to grow if we have the right trade policies. And we're providing input um, to, to the different governments uh, from our auto perspective. So the big boss of GM talking to you earlier. So, yeah, I wonder, uh, also wanted to ask if there's a question there about, and I hate to put a dampener on it, but the whole relevance of the Detroit Motor Show today. You already mentioned CES, but we know most of the German car makers, they're not there this year because they say more and more important announcements are made at other shows, like tech shows. Well, and, and just to give you an idea of that, I've come straight from the Ford stand where there was their unveiling for the Shelby Mustang GT500. Uh, look at this. This is what we were wearing. I've brought you one, Aaron. I'll get it in the post to you. It's a virtual reality headset. That was part of their presentation. It's a nod to sort of where the industry is going. It's more and more, not just the old combustion engine, but a lot more technology. These are computers on wheels. And as a result of that, you're seeing this diffusion of where car makers choose to unveil things. Yes, many of the top sort of German companies are not here. BMW, Daimler, who've been here every year since I've been coming here, they've skipped this year. That being said, VW's chief executive, the rumour going around the floor is that he's here in part possibly because we're expecting announcements of a tie-up or some kind of deal between VW and Ford. The reason behind that goes to the trend in the car industry right now, which is that developing these cars of the future takes a lot of money, and so expect to hear a lot more about partnerships. OK. You know, tens of millions of people saw you just say that you'll send me one of those headsets, so that's a promise. If it's not in the post, if it's not in the post, you're in trouble. Michelle Fleury, good to see you. Michelle Fleury from the Detroit Auto Show. No doubt we're going to have more through, uh, throughout the rest of the week. Hey, talking of week, oh, it's a big one here. It's crunch week for Brexit, with the UK Prime Minister, Theresa May, issuing a last-ditch appeal to MPs to back her withdrawal deal. On the eve of the crucial vote in Parliament, Brussels has provided some new uh, assurances that it doesn't want that controversial backstop to be permanent. That's what it says, uh, the EU says. Damien Grammaticus is in Brussels and joins us. Hey, Damien, great to see you you my friend um listen there's not a lot as you very well know not a lot of optimism over here that this deal is going to get through i'm wondering the mood over there no aaron you're talking about virtual reality a second ago <laughs> this is reality setting in with brexit now as the crunch point arrives in london and the votes in parliament and here everybody sitting watching sort of uh, transfixed really by this parliamentary spectacle that's about to unfold in London. They've issued this letter on the after discussions with Theresa May, giving her some of what she wants, these reassurances, reiterating that uh, the EU side really doesn't want to have to use these provisions about Northern Ireland, that they really will negotiate fast to try to implement a trade deal to replace them, but equally saying they will not reopen what's already on the table. Uh, Theresa May, therefore, doesn't really have something dramatically different to present to Parliament in London. There's a few little things in there that might be helpful to her, including the EU saying uh, that it is open to any ideas in future that could replace this, this complicated provision that's caused so much problem. But the real thing now is going to be the outcome of that vote. EU side here, people looking at it saying it really matters what happens in London, what position she's left in, and then if she does fail to get it through, what does she come back here? She needs to come back to Brussels with a new plan and they will look at it. They might try to help her at that point, but we all now wait to see what happens uh, oh, in Parliament. We sure do, Damien. Busy week for you and I. We'll talk to you soon, mate. Thank you. Damien Grammaticus joining us uh, live from Brussels. Uh, let's just touch on some of the other stories making headline news. Chinese, this is not good news. Chinese exports had their steepest fall in two years last month, tumbling more than 4% compared with the previous December. Uh, it shows, shows further weakening in the world's second biggest economy, which, as we know, is embroiled in that trade war with uh, the United States, I say it's not good news because it's the world's second biggest economy, as I said, and it impacts all of us. A senior US Republican has urged President Donald Trump to temporarily reopen parts of the government, which, as you know, have been shut down for, well, more than three weeks. That partial shutdown is now the longest in US history, and of course it's left hundreds of thousands of public workers unpaid, and uh, certainly government offices closed there. We're keeping on top of that one. And the US mining firm Newmont says it plans to buy smaller rival Gold Corp uh, in a deal valued at $10 billion. So it'd be it would create the world's biggest gold producer by output. 
Yeah. Now, the deal is the second profile, high profile merger in the uh, mining industry since Barrick Gold agreed to buy Rand Gold Resources in 2017. Okay, quick flash of the markets, how they're kicking off the week. Not great. London wobbled at the start of the week. Those Chinese export numbers just rekindle the fears of slowing growth in that economy. Investors also, of course, bracing themselves for the big Brexit vote. The same story in, uh, in Europe, in, in particular, I should say, the Chinese numbers. Nikkei's closed in Tokyo for a public holiday. That's what Hong Kong did. Not very pretty. Again, those uh, mainland economic numbers. Um, also, some good old profit-taking going on in, uh, in Hong Kong. It had, uh, what, six days of a rally, so they've gone in to sell some of those shares and take some of the money off the table. Uh, Brent crude, uh, down $60.12 a barrel. That's what's going to cost you. Get rid of the cube. Okay, I want to talk about uh, what's probably proving to be a bit tough for Turkey's economy. We know its currency, the Turkish lira, has weakened and it all comes after a threat from President Trump to devastate that country's economy if it attacks American Kurdish allies in Syria. Now, the threat followed criticism of Mr. Trump's abrupt decision to withdraw US forces from Syria. So just what could the US do to inflict damage on Turkey's economy? Let's find out. Tim Ash is economist for Blue Bay Asset Management and joins us. Timothy, good to see you. Um, could President Trump and his administration, could they devastate Turkey's economy? And if so, with what tools? I think they could have a, a very significant effect Turkey's problem is it, it needs to refinance about $200 billion of debt every year. Uh, last year they released... Dollar debt, right? Dollar debt. Yeah. Well, it's a combination, but right. essentially uh, Turkey is reliant on dollar markets for rolling most of its debts. Okay. So any restrictions around that, uh, there's an ongoing problem with Hulk Bank around uh, Attila Hakan, or Hakan Attila case in the US, about Iran sanctions busting, and there's a suggestion that restrictions could be put on that bank. It's a state-owned bank. Any messing with dollar liquidity by the US right. would, would set the alarm bell, bells off ringing around Turkey, I think, in, in terms of the market it would. And any further, if we see the lira slipping in value, that just means if they've got any of the, the dollar debt they have, is going to be more expensive for them, right, to pay off the credit card. Sure. I mean, last year we had a balance of payments crisis and a banking crisis in Turkey, and they've managed to stabilise things. They've, they've, they raise rates, they tighten fiscal policy, they've been pushing a fairly orthodox gender. It's kind of worked, they've mm. stabilised it. They don't need anything like this, that's for sure. It's very, very fragile at the moment, I'd say, the state of the Turkish economy and Turkish markets. Do you, do you think, I mean, we've seen President Trump's tactics, different tactics, you know, whether it be trade or, or issues like this. Um, we just want, if this is a tactic, just to, to get ta uh, Turkey to the table, if you will. Well, you know, when you issue a threat, you've got to be willing to follow through on it. The reality yeah, is, good point. Yeah. does the US really want to crash a Turkish economy? This is, you know, a NATO ally, the second biggest standing army in, in Europe. It's a key geopolitical uh, ally in this region. And if, if the US does that, if it mm. really does push to crash the Turkish economy, that relationship's over. So yeah. I think Trump and his advisers need to think really carefully about that. I tend to think it's a negotiating tactic around this idea Pompeo's idea of a 20 kilometer uh, kind of zone, protection zone in northern Syria. Uh, both Turkey and I think the US really want that, and I think this is part of pushing that agenda towards it. So I don't think the US is going to roll out these kind of measures. I think it's kind of just talk from Trump. Yeah, and just, just very briefly, about 30 seconds, even if they did look at sanctions, there's not a lot of trade between the two of them. That, that, sanctions or further sanctions wouldn't have much of an impact, would they? Not really. I mean, I think the things are, there's a very important F-35 contract that's worth about $12 billion to Turkey. Right. Uh, there's also a conflict between the two about, at the moment about, Turkey wants to buy S-400s from Russia. The Americans want Which to sell missile, them Patriot, sorry, yeah. uh, sorry air defense system, yeah. and uh, the, the Americans want to sell Patriot missiles. Some deal could be done around that as well, I ah, think. Okay, uh, it could be a negotiating tool, as, as you say. Um, Timothy, always a pleasure. Thanks very much for joining us. Timothy Ash, joining us there. Hey, it's that time of the program. Let's go and take a look at what's trending online in the business world. South China Morning Post says, can you believe this? Cafe Pacific has done it again. It has sold first-class tickets at economy-class prices. Yeah, the flights were from Hong Kong to Portugal. They were supposed to be 16000 bucks a seat, but a lucky group of customers just paid $1,500 instead. Mm -hmm. It's the second boo-boo this month over wrong prices. But Cathay, bless them, is honouring those tickets. How do you do it? Our own website, the BBC, reports on a family who was forced to sit on the floor of a TUI uh, plane during part of their flight back from Menorca to the UK. When they boarded, they found that their seats were missing. 
I'm not making it up. No. Uh, Tui says a last-minute aircraft change meant that those seats were unavailable. They're not unavailable. They weren't there in the plane. The uh, Civil Aviation Authority is investigating, because that's a big no-no, sitting on the floor in a plane. And from Business Insider, stand aside Kylie Jenner, you know, the US celebrity. She no longer has Instagram's most like photo, which was actually a, a pic of her, her little baby daughter and Kylie's thumb. 18 million people. She uh, uh, now has been, wait for it, she's been overtaken by this. It's a picture of an egg. It's gained 27 million likes on the social media platform. Sorry, Kylie, you can't win them all, can you? Hey, coming up. So, paying huge salaries motivates staff? Buying a table tennis will make your staff happier, huh? Well, our next guest is going to explain why so many workplace stereotypes are pure bunkum. Yeah, pure rubbish. See you after the break. Hey, welcome back to Talking Business with me, Aaron Hazelhurst. The top story, and it's the Detroit Auto Show is getting into gear, but it is overshadowed by, well, falling global sales, layoffs, and trade tensions with China. In fact, three German car makers, BMW, Mercedes-Benz, and Audi, are staying away this year. They're not even going. No. And now for the last little snippet from the big tech show in Las Vegas, which wrapped up last Friday, our tech reporter, Chris Fox, got an exclusive peek at what could be the sat-nav of the future. For years, movies have promised us heads-up displays in our cars. Well, here's one company that thinks it's finally cracked it. So I'm driving this mock-up car in a hotel suite. At the bottom, I really have got all my information kind of projected into my eyes. It feels like the graphics are floating over the road. I've got my speedo, I've got my directions telling me which way to go. And this isn't part of the video that's playing in front of me, because if I lean to the side, those projections disappear. They are kind of just floating out in space. It's <laughs> very cool. This is very cool. Currently, almost every other display technology that's on the market today uses what's called light valves. This is true holography. We really are uh, ma manipulating and messing with the speed of light and causing it to behave in you know, radically new ways. There's always a big focus at CES on driverless cars being the future. Does this have a short shelf life? Autonomous cars are coming, but uh, between now and then, there's a, an array of steps we have to go through to get adoption. And this technology can really help that adoption by showing the driver what the car understands by highlighting it. Ah, that is cool. Hey, does paying higher salaries mean greater motivation? Will buying a table tennis make your staff happier? Are millennials changing the workplace? Well, we thought we'd have a stab at sorting out workplace myths from facts, and Ian McRae is director of high potential psychology and a familiar face, and joins us. Good to see you again, Ian. Um, you're, you're here to debunk, right, some of these myths. Yep. You're going to tell me that millennials aren't changing our workplace. Well, I think the workplace has been changing for quite a while. It's okay. not necessarily millennials that have been doing it. Um, because when you look at all the research, millennials aren't very different as a group compared to older workers. So there's as much variation within any group as between them. So sometimes millennials get a bad rap for saying they're social media obsessed narcissists, right? But there's mm. also 72 year old people you've talked about on the show today that could fit that description as well. So it's not necessarily an age thing. So this whole, like, you know, well, it's been around for some time, but the whole Google Office kind of that sort of setup. Yeah. I thought that was driven by young, techie, and that was their environment that they thrived in. Well, that was kind of a trend that I think is dying out a bit now. Yeah. But really having a ball pit or a slide or a playground in the office <laughs> isn't really going to make much of a difference for productivity. So hopefully people are learning that now, that there's more effective ways to make people productive. Yeah, you've got a whole list here of the... So let's uh, go through some of them quickly. Uh, staff should work eight hours. Uh, what, eight hour days, Monday to Friday. Well, now I know that's rubbish. The Swedes have picked up on that, right? Yeah. yeah, and most big companies now are too. That's one of the things tech companies have done really well is making offices more flexible. Mm. So making work fit people's schedules more, that flexibility. Because people should work when they're most productive, when they want to work most, instead of forcing people to be there at a certain time. You mentioned uh, millennials and, and social media. Social yep. media should not be allowed in the office places. Well, most workplaces now need social media. Yeah. Like if you're a marketing company, if you're a recruiter, you need social media. The other research has found that when you ban social media, 80% of people use it anyway. So the better way to approach it is to have some guidelines, have some specific types of social media, types of procedures that people can use in the office. Let's talk about the big one, the, one, the, the motivating people. 
I mean, <laughs> yeah, you could be you could be highly motivated if you if they pay you more, can you? Or a bit more motivated? I mean, you could be. It sounds like you really could be. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what the BBC pays. I don't. <laughs> but money has more of a power to demotivate people or to make them grumpy at work. Oh, okay. So if people don't think they're getting paid enough or know they're not getting paid hmm. enough, if people have trouble with rent and bills and paying that, then they're going to be demotivated. If people aren't making as much as their colleagues, then that's going to make them less happy at work too. But beyond a certain level, money doesn't have a huge influence on how happy people are at work. What about relationships at work? Well, that's, no, that's a big no-no. That's the tough one. I mean, they happen anyway. They do happen. No, Most people right, right, yeah. meet people through workplaces. Mm. So that's an interesting one that's been in the news a lot lately because it's really important to define the barrier between kind of appropriate relationships and harassment or aggression or bullying in the workplace. Um, so the reality is it's good to have policies about those and to make have these kind of, um, kind of clear-cut guidelines, what's appropriate. I mean, like obviously teachers, doctors, nurses, you can't have a relationship with a patient or a student. Well, no, no, no. you got about uh, 10 seconds. Computers are going to take our Jobs. About half of the people, maybe. About half of the people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Ian, good to see you again. You, you yeah. know the ropes. You and I are now going to go to Wall Street to see how the markets are kicking off for the beginning of the week. And as expected, they're following what we've seen in Asia and Europe. And those, those China trade numbers are just really disappointing for, uh, for many around the globe. It's a global story. Remember that. Hey, follow me on Twitter. You can get me at BBC Aaron. I'm back same time, same place tomorrow. Yalder is back. She finally came back from holiday. She's back at the top of the hour. I'll see you soon. Thanks, Ian. Thank <laughs> you.